So good evening all and uh, thank you very much uh, for tuning in. It's a wonderful and great moment for uh, All India Runners Motivation. Uh, and uh, we thought in January uh, 2021, we will get uh, international athletes for January uh, to hopefully uh, motivate and inspire our, our athletes. And we thought of getting uh, medalists from, you know, who have won Olympic medals and world championship medals uh, to this forum and uh, with the hope that uh, you know uh, the inspiration provided by them will help our country uh, to men win medals and today it's a great honor for me uh, that uh, we have got uh, in our midst and it's the first interview for me so it's like a fan moment also for me uh, you know the first uh, olympic medalist i'm interviewing uh, she has been um, uh, olympic medalist in 10000 meters she has got uh, many many world uh, championship medals she have, who held lot of world records from uh, 8k uh, to half marathon uh, she has run uh, the marathon she had the best time as a as a marathoner best debut time she has won london marathon tokyo marathon and new york marathon it gives me great pride and privilege uh, that she is uh, uh, talking to us for the first time to all the athletes in india uh, ladies and gentlemen please welcome uh, liz mccolgan hello nice hi day. how are you hi. Thank you. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here and uh, honored to be invited onto your show. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, so how is Qatar? How is the weather now? The weather's perfect in Qatar just now. Um, usually it's very hot, usually it's very humid and is absolutely perfect endurance running weather just now. It's our winter, so it's around about 17 degrees, a um, bit overcast most days and perfect running weather so um these these next few months uh it's a pleasure to run outside rather than it being like really really difficult so um so yeah we're, we're in a good spell just now over in qatar okay uh, otherwise most of the runs are early mornings uh, in the middle east or uh, maybe late night maybe sometimes uh, i tend to run most late in the evening than in the morning um i found that um in the morning it can be um a bit more humid so i, I tend to when when it's a going up to the 40 degrees and you know high humidity i tend to run about sort of 5 30 sort of six at night just where the it's crossing over down into the sundown and um it seems to be less humid less hot okay. because i've got the the bright sunshine okay i mean i i, mean, I know that temperatures uh, can go up to 48 to 50 uh, <laughs> degrees in the middle east yeah okay uh, so uh, I know that you grew up in Dundee. Uh, so can you just tell us a bit about uh, Dundee? And uh, I, I heard there's a there's a movie or a series coming out uh, from your hometown, and you were quite excited about it. Yeah, I was actually. I actually wa I binge watched it on on uh, a day and a half. So I watched the six episodes, and it was great to see my hometown, um, just like landmarks and and places where you know I used to go by and things like that. So it was really interesting. I loved it. But um, yeah, I'm from Dundee, which is a little town on the northeast coast. It's, it was quite an industrial town, but due to um, failing economy over the last few years, it's not um, a very affluent town, uh, very high unemployment. Um, and I was brought up on a council estate, so um, both my parents were pretty poor and I didn't get an awful lot of opportunities to do sports. And the reason I got into running was because it was free. You know, I just put a pair of shoes on and out the door. Um, and so that's kind of why I kind of fell into running. But, um, but yeah, you know, it, 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 Dundee for me is um, it's a, it's a very important part of my history. And I think that if I hadn't been from a town like that, um, I wouldn't have been as successful as what I was as a runner because it instilled a drive and um, a passion in me. Um, kind of like our football teams. We've got two football teams, Dundee and Dundee United, and we're all very passionate about them, Scottish football. But, um, you know, it is a very, very working class town, but I think it has a great ethos of support. And when people, um, you know, they're very, very sports minded. And um, so, uh, you know, it was a great town to be from. Okay, that's nice. Uh, we've got a lot of people tuning in and conveying their hellos uh, all over India. Uh, so we have people from the west of India. Uh, there's a legendary coach of India, Simon D'Souza, uh, uh -huh. who is tuning in and conveying his hellos. Uh, mm -hmm. And we got people from the south of India also conveying their hellos. So we got a, a wide range of audience. 
uh, and uh, I'm hoping that we got few other people also coming in later uh, and hopefully tuning in to listen to you. Um, so uh, I mean, I I mean, I, in my research, I read a lot about you and you know, uh, uh, followed a lot of interviews about you, and where you're telling that uh, you got serious uh, in running at the age of uh, 16, and you are practically running around uh, 90 miles a week. Uh, so tell us something about uh, that time when you started running. What were you, what were you aiming for at that time? Um, when I started running, I was 11. I was in first year of secondary school. And the reason that I started running was because my PE teacher, who was a marathon runner, um, just a club level one, um, he used to put us out on cross-country races. And um, I used to sort of win my class races and things. And I was always a very fidgety child, always had lots of energy. And he just thought that running would be really good for me. So um, he kind of took me under his wing and took me along to the local club where I got introduced to a coach. And when I went to the club, I used to do high jumping sprints and I was never very good at them. I was okay at the high jump, I jumped about 155, but um, sprints, I just didn't really have any speed. Um, and then we did a charity night where we had to run laps for to raise money for her club and being a sprint group they couldn't really run many laps and i just you know i was able to go and go and go and quite naturally i had like this endurance in me and then my coach after we did that said oh look you're not a sprinter you're an endurance runner you need to go in another group and then that was kind of like where i got discovered and where i blossomed i, I joined like a, a, a lot older group i was the youngest by a lot and it was mainly men there was maybe another one woman who was about eight years older than me um, and I thrived on it, you know, um, to me endurance has always been natural. Um, as a 16 year old, I used to run 90 miles a week. Um, you know, I, I, I was very lucky. I was quite, a, I think because I, I always, I, I kin myself to Kenyan because, because we were kind of poor, um, I used to run to school and I used to run to the, the training sessions. So, you know, I never sort of got the bus anywhere or whatever. So I had all these miles without actually adding them up. You know, I, I was, uh, you know, every day I'd run to school, run back from school, run to training, run back from training, as well as my training. So I built a big, big endurance base without even knowing it. And um, so when I was 16, I'd ran about two, seven, four and 800 metres, which got me third ranked in the UK. I left school and was working in a jute mill and I worked in a jute mill for, from 16 to 17 and when I, just before my 17th birthday I got the opportunity uh, of a scholarship to America and I accepted that, it was my first time ever being outside Scotland and I, I went to the University of Alabama and um, that just made me into the runner because when I lived in Dundee, um, you know, we we were we were quite poor, and I, you know, we didn't watch television, we didn't have electricity and things, so we didn't watch television and that. So there was no role models for me to say, oh, I want to be an Olympic champion, or you know, that was so far removed from where I was as a child that um, I never ever dreamed of being on GB teams. All I all I did with my I I enjoyed running. It gave me an escapism of the lifestyle I was in and um, I've kind of got a mindset where I really really enjoy pushing myself and I, I always like to test myself and I'm very hard on myself so running for my mindset was really a great sport and it, you know I went from being a very unconfident child through running to being a very very confident person um, so it actually changed my whole persona when I got into running um, yeah many 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 years to do it you know um i went to university in alabama when i was just turned 17 and then i was there for four years and then when i came back um i nobody sort of knew who i was and whatever and i was back and i came back qualified for commonwealth games and won my first ever commonwealth games title that year from returning um from america i also won the nc2a's in america so i was the first british person ever to win the nc2a title in the states Wonderful. Um, so you know, I, for me, you know, um, going to America was a really big thing for me. Um, I don't think it's quite the same situation as what you need to do now to make it as a runner. But back in the day when I was running, it was a major opportunity. Um, you know, a sort of once in a lifetime uh, opportunity to try and go and make something of myself. And not just for the running, but also for the education, because I was working in a jute mill. Um, so... You know, for me, running just opened a whole new world. And, um, you know, it was never about 
going to Olympics. It was never about being an Olympian or a world champion. It was about just how fast can I, you know, how fast can I go? I was very time orientated. You know, I, I was always trying to beat personal best from you know runs before always timed everything and um it, it just really you know i just embraced the whole of what running was and um it wasn't until i got it wasn't really until i won my commonwealth games medal that i started to realize oh, i can maybe take this somewhere you know i can maybe get to the olympics and and you know but that was that wasn't until i was like sort of you know going into my 20s that i actually started to believe that I can do something special here um, because up until then um, I never had um, you know my my club coach died when I was 17 and I was self coached so up until then um, I never really had um, you know anyone saying you know or how good you could be or not be or whatever and, and there was nobody like directing me you know I, I was sort of doing everything myself so um, it wasn't until I started winning that I started getting confidence and believing that, yeah, I could maybe do something really special here. Wonderful. That's so nice uh, hearing about uh, your story. And you said that, you know, uh, your life is something similar to the Kenyans where you had to run for everything from home to school and school to training center and back. And um, uh, you talked about your coach, um, Harry Bennett. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, tell us a bit about him and uh, what are the things you actually learned from him? Um, he was really like I, I I say he was well ahead of his years as far as coaching was. Like um, when I when I started working with Harry, I was only twelve, and um, he he would like he I would just run down his house and then we'd run along to training together to meet the group, and like when I'd be in his house, he'd be like giving me books of um, the loneliness of a long distance runner, and he'd um, give me all these uh, like athletics coaches books to read because he said to me i want you to understand why you're doing a session you know i don't want you just to come along and do what you're told i want you to understand why i'm getting you to do things like this and then um, and he always said that um he always said to me that i would be a ten thousand meter runner and that i would i would do something really special and at the time women could only run three thousand meters which is only seven and a half laps of the track women weren't allowed to run any further and, yeah. I, and I, I remember saying to him like what do you mean I'm going to run 10,000? How far is that? And he's like, oh, it's, you know, it'll be 25 laps of the track. And I was like, well, never, you know, women don't do that. You know, you just sort of, yeah, okay, then I'll do that. And I just sort of accepted what he used to say to me. But um, he, he, he was, um, he gave me a lot of confidence and he gave me a lot of confidence to be me for who I am. He didn't try to change me. He didn't try to say, oh, you know, you have to do this and whatever. It was like, he let me make decisions even at a young age. And I think that for me was where I, it helped me blossom and it helped me be able to cope with things when he did die because he, he died very suddenly on a run. Um, yeah. When he was running, he had a heart attack and that was him gone. Um, and I think for me, I, I mean, I was only 17 at the time. Um, it was a massive, massive shock. And it was like, you know, I knew that I could go on and do it myself because of the education he gave me and the belief that he gave me about me. You know, he, he believed in everything about me. And he used to always say to me, like, you know, you know, you're going to be good. You're going, to, you're not good now, but you're going to be good. And you know, once once you get to the ten thousand, and you start doing this and that, he says you're going to be really, really good. And uh, and I just held on to what he said. And um, you know, a, a, one word from one person can make a world of a difference. And I think that people that are successful have that one person, you know, that said one thing to them that's just changed their whole ethos of what they think about themselves and where they're going and for me harry was that person okay wonderful uh, so yeah i mean he said you said that he gave you a lot of books to read uh, any favorite books at that time which helped you you know i still got one of the books which is the the loneliness of the long distance runner i think it's, it's old school but it works you know okay. uh, and even now i you know i find myself drifting back and just reading over certain things in it that you know I, that sort of sprung to mind and I quite liked, you know, in the early days and things like that. But um but it's kinda like a running Bible, if you know what I mean, you just sort of keep looking back at it every now and again just to um just sort of back up what your thought process is and what I'm doing with my athletes just now. I mean the is that the original book which you read actually during your younger days? You still have it? Yes. W wonderful. That's amazing. So there's like how many decades it has gone through now? Or how many house shifting has it gone through? <laughs> Ha <laughs>
Okay. Uh, so, I mean, um, when, when did your parents actually note uh, that, you know, Liz could run? You said that they were extremely busy <laughs> at that time. My mum and dad didn't really take much notice of me at all when I was running. Like they, they never, they never came to any of my races, and they never, um, they never, you know, they never really used to know I was away training and things like that because I was kind of just left to my own devices. Um, and I mean, the first time that my dad saw me running was I was nagging him and nagging him. It was a the Dundee schools competition where there's usually about 250 300 kids all go and run cross country and I was nagging at my dad nagging at my dad and then my PE teacher actually called him and said oh you know Mr Lynch there's the cross country on it'd be good if you can come down and support we want some parents there and whatever and my dad's like oh yeah fair dues like and um so he came down late and he just sort of caught like the sort of middle to end of my race and um Obviously, the group's running past and whatever, and uh, the PE teacher, Mr. Cairn, said to him, my dad said to him, oh, oh where's Liz? I've came down to watch Liz's race, and uh, Bill said, oh, she's racing now. And he says, oh, where is she? And, and uh, he was looking at the back, and he was like, what's she in this group here? Where is she? And Phil was like, no, Martin, if you look way up there, round the corner, down that back straight, there's Elizabeth there. And my dad was just gobsmacked. He couldn't believe how far ahead I was everybody and that was when that was the first time he then became very aware of you know something special going on in my daughter and then they started to be a lot more interested and um and like you know more supportive like he'd drive me to my races and things like that and come and watch and um but he never he can never come to a championship because he used to think that he jinxed me it was like okay. if I come and watch the Olympics or something, you'll lose. If I come and you know, so you, you would never watch it. And then even when I was on the telly, he gets so nervous he'd walk out of the room. He couldn't watch me running it. So, so uh, that's nice. So, so, what was his reaction after that race? Uh, you know, when he saw you far ahead, when he realized that you know you could run. Uh, so when you came back, you know, what were those first words which was exchanged uh, between you guys? I remember he just said to me, "I didn't realize that you were that good." And you know, and and it was as simple as that, you know. And and as soon as he saw it, it just like opened up, you know. He was just like, oh, you know, because my dad was really into football, and my yeah. brother was a footballer. I'm I'm one of four siblings, and my brother was a really really good footballer. So everything in our household was around, you know, Kevin and his football. And so, okay, guys, okay. oh, you know, like Liz can, you know, Elizabeth can run, and um, and and. He was, they, they were very, very supportive. As soon as they saw how serious I was about it, they, they then became on board and very supportive and tried to help me out, you know, tried to save to get running shoes and tried to okay. save to get a back suit and things like that. So, um, yeah, it, it was a, a big, big turning point um, for m my running career, having my mum and dad on board with me. That's, I mean, I can just imagine the dinner table at, on that day when your dad was praising, praising you and mm. your, your siblings also listening to to him and uh, that would have been a good uh you know a good thing to hear at that time yeah yeah no no they, um as i say like my, my my brothers and sisters have always been um supportive it's just that you know my my brother was such a good footballer that um you, you didn't expect anybody else to and also being a girl you didn't expect me to be anything sporty you know i, I was just like i was a, a typical tomboy kind of girl you know i'd play football with my brothers and tennis with my brothers and but i never got to do anything you know I, I i was just like messing about with my brothers all the time whereas you know this was the first time where it was actually noticed that you know she is a lot better than the other kids her age for what she's okay. doing so that's nice I mean, you, you so you spoke about your coach uh, harry and after his passing away you you self-coached yourself yeah. Uh, so I mean, and that started at a, at a very young age, right? I mean, you talk we're talking about nineteen years, eighteen, nineteen years. Uh, how did you manage to you know to do that? Because uh, you know, uh, how did you manage to maybe make your schedules? Uh, because I know that it is pers it is personal to you, and uh, yeah. uh, and you try to do that now actually with your trainees. But uh, how did you manage yourself at that time? From the age of eleven, I kept training diaries, so I had every training session that I did um you know when i started and i i think that i really did have a good grasp on what endurance running is and, and what endurance running for me is you know i i kind of knew what made me tick and also the the conversations that i had with harry and the sessions that i had from harry especially in that last year 
before he died, um, had already set my mind and, and what I believe endurance running is and, and how to be good at endurance running. So, um, you know, so it, it, the, the only thing I would say was very hard about it is when you're self-coached and you know you're sort of going into your final preparation for a race sometimes it's good just to have that coach in the background saying yep you did everything right you know focus on what you're doing don't worry about it don't second doubt it as as a self-coached athlete you tend to sort of like oh have i covered everything you know I, I, have i got myself in the best shape possible and, you know sometimes there's a little a little um second of doubt and like could i have done this better could i have did that better and you sort of get a bit panicky before a major championship because you haven't got that voice on on, on your shoulder saying no we've done it right we've prepared well and da, da, da. so you know because it's a partnership with a coach isn't it it's not just the athlete it's not just the coach it's a partnership and when you're self-coached you haven't got that okay would you recommend that uh to anyone now self-coaching um, very individual thing. I mean, I tried. I, you know, I tried to um, be co I, I, I coached by other people, but they just didn't have the same ethos of me on endurance running, and I didn't run well under them. Um, I, I didn't enjoy the training under them, and you know, I tried. You know, two or three different people, and it was just like, no, nah, this is not working. And so I, I was actually better training myself. Um, again, it's a very individual thing. I'm, I'm quite strong-willed. I'm quite strong-minded. I, I can push myself really hard. I don't need a coach there motivating me to do it. Some people actually need a coach there for the motivation to get on and do it. I'm not like that. So, um, you know, it's very individual as to, you know, can you self-coach yourself? Um, you know, most work in partnerships. Like, I mean, I coach my daughter and it's a great coach relationship. You know, I, I thoroughly enjoy being a coach there. But, um, you know, it, it's not for everybody. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, you uh, you did extremely well, uh, you know, in all the events, I mean, ranging from 1,500 meters to the marathon. Uh, 10,000 meters seems to be always a favorite. I know that uh, Coach Harry told you about it, but any reason why it is your uh, your favorite? Because you're, you're done extremely well and you won maximum yeah. number of medals in that. Yeah, well, I mean, I've ran 4-1 for 1,500. So as a marathoner, that's pretty good speed. Um, it's not fast enough to be um, top in the world or world class at 15. Um, but it's still very quick for to bring that to 10K in marathon running. So I think I had a really good mix of um, good pace with endurance. And I think 10K marries that well together. Um, I personally am a better road runner. Um, I am very efficient on the road. I um, find road running a lot easier than track running. Um, so, you know, I, but it's the same old, same old, like, you know, I, I always think that, you know, you've got to utilize and maximize your speed with your endurance. And as you get older, you get physically stronger as well. So, you know, you don't want to go into the longer distances too early, but at the same time, you want to maximize on the short distances. You might not be as good at them but you need to maximise on them so that you can bring that speed, whatever that is for you, your, your optimum speed, bring it along with you and then make it into the best longer distance runner that you could possibly be. I mean, if you look at international running now, you know, some of the girls and, and the men, like their last lap splits is just ridiculous, you know? So you do need to be, you know, like um, really good speed, no matter what distance you run now to finish strong and to be competitive. And so, um, for me, I think I had, uh, you know, I had quite a, a decent balance of that. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, you know, you said earlier that you know, when, uh, when it comes to confidence, uh, uh, you used to always get uh, jittery. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, how did you manage uh, to overcome this uh, uh, not so confident, uh, and being a not so confident to a, a person who started winning a lot of races? Uh, yeah. What, what um, did you do to do that? My confidence came from my training. Um, I knew, um, I got to a point in my racing career where I knew that no other woman was capable of doing the workload and the training that I was doing. I just knew it from what I was doing. And um, and when you, when you do certain sessions and, and, and run certain times, the confidence is there because you know you've done it. 
and 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 that's what changed me you know um i i you know i was a very intense trainer i did train extremely hard although I, although i did a lot of um miles i did good quality miles i was never a slow paced long runner you know i i was a fast paced long runner um okay. so you know i just i just used to um I just think that um, the longer I went, the easier it is for me. Like I, I, when I ran a marathon, I never hit a wall or any, I never had that heaviness in my legs. I've never experienced it at all in any of my career. And there was one time um, I met the late uh, Greta Weitz and we were in Gainesville and uh, over my latter part of my career, Greta became my mentor and, you know, and started coaching me. So that was my sort of... Um, and towards the end of my career, she was my coach and she was the only person that I could actually work with. It was like my relationship with Harry because we were very, very similar in our mindset and our ethos of running. But there was one time she said to me, like, let's go and run a five mile loop and we'll see if we can create this heaviness so that you, you, you know what it feels like. And we got to, like, we were doing five mile loops and um, we got to the fifth loop, which was 25 miles. And I actually ran through the marathon, like something like 230, something like 220, yeah, 230-ish or something like that was actual pace. So we were actually running quick. And she says, right, let's do another lap. Because like nothing was happening. So we actually ran 30 miles at like 235 pace or something. And I still never got the heaviness in my legs. And then I said, I'm not going to go and do another lap because that's like 35 miles. I ain't doing 35 miles. And she says, no, what we'll do is we'll go for a run at night. So after running 30 miles, about five o'clock that night, we went for a run and then I felt the heaviness because I'd, I'd never had such stiffness and tiredness in my legs when I tried to run a five mile that night. But um, but yeah, so, you know, it's um, also several ways to skin a cat. But I mean, it's like um, you've got to find a way that suits you as an endurance runner. And for me, confidence came from knowing what I was capable of doing. And I now know if I did it in training, the type of runner I am, I can produce it in a race. Um, and so my training was was very crucial uh, in me gaining confidence. Okay. Uh, so you never had any easy pace run? Liz, always, you love to run faster. Uh, I mean, there is never I'm, anything I'm easy. Yeah, I think a lot of girls are a bit like like me. Like, you know, I, as soon as I got out the door, it'd be like, you know, six minute miles right away. Um, okay. I, I, was always, I was always, my runs were always quite quick. Even when I okay. did my miles, like 20 miles, I never, I never went like, you know, like my, my long runs would be something like um, 550 mile pace, no matter okay. how long. Um, okay. I, I was very efficient in my running. So um, I, I never did lots of, like long, slow, steady miles. Never. Okay. I mean, a lot, lot of messages coming out here saying that you're superb. You know, what an inspiration. Uh, you know, true confidence is all about hard and intelligent work and you put in your desired goals. So uh, and you took that confidence and within, uh, you know, uh, what, around less than 10 years of training, you you went uh, to, uh, to win a medal at the Olympics in Seoul uh, for the 10,000 meters. Uh, just tell us about uh, that race and how did you feel after winning that medal? To be honest, an endurance runner's career is really long, eh? Because like, as we get older, we get our VO2 and that improves. So it's like, you know, endurance-wise, as a woman, you're not at your strongest for marathon until you're in your 30s. And so you've got a, you know, I started running eights and 1500. So, you know, I had a big, big gold long career um, right up until I retired um, in 97. Um, and I only retired because um, I had arthritis in my foot. It wasn't due to massive injuries or whatever. It was an, a, a genetic thing that I had in my foot. And my sister's got the same thing. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, you know, for to to have such a long experience, or like a, a long career, you know, there's never a rush. And I think, like, you know, athletes of the day are always in too much of a hurry to get there. And it's like, you know, you've got to let the body develop at the right pace for you, whatever that be. And um, so for me, I always knew in my mindset that, um, you know, I was a long distance runner. You know, the marathon is going to be my ultimate. That's where I'm going. And I always knew that from like, you know, sort of 17, 18, 19 years of age. But I had a lot of work to do before it. It took me 10 years of training to be Commonwealth Games champion. And then it took me a further 10 years um, to be London Marathon runner, 
Yeah, it's a long old time of training. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. And every race isn't a victory. You know, there's more down bad races that you need to um, accept the experience in than before the ones that you win and get the glory for. You know, the, the glory ones are few and far between. You know, there's a lot more heartache and disappointments along that time period um, that nobody ever really sees, you know, and, and you've got to deal with it and get strong with it and learn from it. And, you know, I was a great believer that every race gives me an opportunity, whether it's a good race or a bad race, I always take a positive out of it because I used to always, I've had a fantastic race, I always used to analyse it and say, well, where could it be better? I've had a really bad race, I used to analyse it and say, you know, where did it go wrong? What can I do to make it better? So every race was an opportunity to be a better athlete, no matter whether you won or lost. And um, I've always carried that all throughout my career and I've always carried it with my athletes that I coach as well. Wonderful. Uh, before we uh, before I ask you another question, I just wanted to let you know, uh, Douglas uh, Wakihuri has joined the, uh, the link and uh, uh, so from one Olympic medalist to another, he's saying uh, Jambo Liz uh, yeah. and he's loving the interview. So you want to say something to Douglas, you can. <laughs> yeah, I know Douglas very well. We go back, way back. <laughs> <laughs> and we were Kazakhs athletes. And uh, I was saying that I remember when I first met Douglas, he had a record in the charts in Tokyo. He was a bit of a pop star back then. Okay, that's nice. Uh, so I, I got a question from uh, from uh, from a, a friend of mine, Guru Murthy. He's saying that have you trained with uh, Svetlana Maskrova, uh, Mastakova, uh, and uh, you know, did you train with her? Did you run with her? And how was the experience? No, no, uh, no. I've never, no, 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 no. I've never trained with her at all. No. Okay, fine. Uh, so let's get back to Olympics. Uh, five tips from Liz uh, for all the professional athletes on uh, you know. Uh, how to win a medal in Olympics? It's not an easy task. Um, to win to win a medal is is just being a very dedicated trainer, um, an athlete that knows their discipline. So, like my ten thousand meters, I knew how to run that inside out. You know, you've got you've got to um, decipher how, like you know, what time you think is going to win that race and then you need to plan how you're going to run that time and you know it takes a lot of training it takes a lot of planning and it takes a bit of luck as well um and like for when i won my world title i trained for three years specifically for that one race um i knew it was in tokyo i knew it was going to be hot and humid I'm from Scotland, which is not hot and humid, and it's not yes. warm. So yeah. I took off to Gainesville, Florida, and um, I trained in Gainesville for a few months to get used to the humidity. I set up a treadmill in a steam room, and I trained some ridiculously tough sessions in a steam room, so it was humid, and I got I got myself into faster shape than I believed we'd have to take to win that race. You know, when I won my Tokyo title, I was in sub 30 minute shape for 10K. Right. And I knew you could, was either going to have to run hard. <laughs> you, you could have just come to India. The steam room was not required. You know, south of India, uh, near the seashore, Goa, yeah. a great place. No steam room required. Humidity is natural. Uh, you know, so good for your skin also. Yeah, I was quite a believer. <laughs> like, I, I firmly believe that heat and humidity is just as stressful training environment as going to altitude. So I didn't go to altitude. I always went hot and humid. And I okay. think I got some great results from training in extreme weather. Like I'd be in Gainesville, it would be like 90% um, humidity and it'd be about 89, 90 degrees. It was, uh, it was awful. And I remember doing sessions out there and people like people from the team Russia, you know, looking at me thinking, what is she doing? Um, and I, I was just, you know, I, I used to train at the hottest time of the day um, just to put the stress through me. And it paid off because, you know, in that race in Tokyo, it was, a, I think they said it was like the humidest and hottest recorded. They actually, it was the first time they ever put water onto the track so that you can actually take a drink of water while racing for 10K. And I think, I think I was, I think it was like, I was the only non, like European to actually finish the race. I think most of the people were 
you know, Asian or American or whatever that were used to, you know, Europeans really, really suffer because it was so hot and humid. But, um, you know, I, I had purposely planned three years work to try and get it. Okay. So, uh, so I mean, uh, what sacrifices does uh, did you have to do, or uh, you know, during that time? Uh, a lot of sacrifices. Like, you have a... no life whatsoever. Um, my diet was very, very restricted. You know, I, I wouldn't eat um, chocolates, and there were certain foods, and, like sweets, candies, cakes, you know, nothing. I, I was so restricted, and, and um, you know, I used to look at my body like a car. I, you know, I'd only put good fuel into it. Um, you know, you've, you've got a very limited, like, like when I trained, I would be in bed at nine o'clock, up training at five, get breakfast in the gym, have a little nap, out to the track, back home, tea in bed. You know, that was it. It was eat, sleep, train. You know, it, it was just repeat, repeat, repeat. So, and you miss a lot of family time. You miss a lot of your, you know, you time with parents and siblings and things like that and also um at the time um it was quite difficult because you know when i when i was world champion i just had a baby and i had wanted a baby for a long long time and you know i kind of had that kind of like uh yearning i just wanted to start a family but i couldn't because of my running and then i ended up getting pregnant not realizing and Ailis was born and um i won my world title nine months after i had her and it was really difficult. I wasn't one of these parents who had like nannies and all this sort of stuff. You know, I, I looked after her myself. And um, so that was difficult traveling with a youngster and trying to balance that kind of family life. And, um, and you know, I, I used to feel a bit guilty in the fact that, you know, I used to have to go training and not be able to go to the park with her and things like that. And um, so, you know, you do sacrifice a lot. But at the end of the day, you know, um, it, it, you know, it, it, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have changed it. Okay. Yeah. So you described your uh, sacrifices and your training schedule. Uh, you know, when you said, okay, eat, uh, eat, train, sleep, eat, sleep. So Douglas, out there, must be wondering. That is a Kenyan way you're describing. You <laughs> yeah. know. <laughs> so. Yeah. Not a Kenyan way specifically. Any top athlete that is what they do um because you cannot afford to be tired and you, it's all about recovery and sleep and sleep's just as important as a training program um you know it has to be built into it and you have to be recovered and to keep yourself healthy you've got to visit your physio and you've got to do, and you know so your whole day is around what running is and um you, you know i i i used to be on a therapy bed for like you know two hours a day um you know I, i'd be running 140 miles a week you know there wasn't a lot of time for anything else um you know but that's the routine that any top athlete has to do it, it's and i don't call it a sacrifice because it's a it's a lifestyle choice and yeah. i actually enjoyed doing it it wasn't a it wasn't a bind to me to get up and run in the morning i loved getting up and going for a run in the morning and um, the harder sessions were the better buzz i got from them um, so I'm, you know, I'm, it was never, it was never a sacrifice to me. You know, it was just a restricted lifestyle for a period of time. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, so a uh, lot of athletes, you know, I mean, when I uh, read about the history and I interviewed, and uh, uh, they run kind of faster times after they manage to come back from the birth of their child. And you also ran your lifetime best uh, for the 10,000 meters. Time was 30:57. Uh, you know, uh, just seven months after Ailish was born. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how did you manage your trainings during that time? And is there any connection between you know childbirth and faster times? Yeah, well, my fastest time is thirty thirty eight. Um, okay. For, yeah. But um, like for me, it um, it was quite a natural. Like I I got pregnant. And I didn't know I was pregnant, so I was running one hundred and ten miles, one hundred and twenty miles, and I was like four months pregnant. Hadn't a clue I was pregnant. Then I found out I was pregnant and I just continued to run all the way through it. But I wasn't, you know, I wasn't putting spikes on and going down the track. I was just going for nice steady runs, listening to my body. If my body was tired, I'd run slow. If I felt good, I'd run quick. And I, so I let my body dictate to me. And I'm very in tune with my body, always have been. Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of ran right up to the the morning before I went into labour. I went for a five mile run and I got to about... 
I know about 20 minutes and I took a really, really sharp pain in my stomach and I took that as a thing. Ooh, that's, that's different. That's, you know, that's not quite right. So I went back to the house and then I went to labour that night. And then, um, you know, with me, I had always known that I was going to get back into my running. Just because I had a child doesn't mean to say that I, you know, I was never going to get back running. I had no, um, not even one thought in my head that it, it would never happen. Um, I got dropped by Nike because I was pregnant. Um, you know, I had no sponsor for that whole year. Um, and so I didn't know, you know, what level I would be able to come back into. But at the back of my mind, I always had the World Championships. I always, always, always had, like, I'm a big believer in visualization. And, you know, I'd have like stickers up with Tokyo and I'd have something else up with, you know, 10K. And, and I always had like little things in the back of my head that's like, you know, I'm going to be ready for Tokyo. And then as soon as the Ailish was born, um, I was pretty much right into it. I, I ran my first race in America about six weeks after I had her, and it was a 5K, and I won that against some pretty decent Russian girls. And then 12 weeks after I had her, I won a bronze medal at the World Cross Country. And then nine months after I had her, I was world champion. But I honestly don't think that, um, that I felt physically better or stronger because I had a baby. I think what happened with me was, um, in, in uh, Seoul, I was so disillusioned with my um, silver medal that I actually thought, well, I just want to stop running because I, I, I got to the point where I thought, you know, I'm never going to be able to beat these drug cheats and things. You know, that you're always racing against people that are taking drugs and, um, and me being a clean athlete, I got really quite low about it and it was, it was quite a difficult time for me. And um, so when when I got pregnant, it, it took all that kind of, I don't know whether it was a feeling sorry for myself kind of mood that I was in because, you know, I'd, I'd sort of like got the silver and I'd trained really hard and wanted to win the gold, didn't get it, whatever. Um, when I got pregnant, it made me more relaxed. And then I stopped thinking in that train that I was thinking, oh, what, you know, what, what do I need to do to, to beat these girls? You know, what is it I need to do? And so it, it, it let me relax and chill out. And then as I was starting getting back into it after the baby, it was like I got my love for my running back again. And I got the old me that didn't really care about what anybody else did. I'm just going to focus on me and do the best for me. So it kind of really flipped, switched a switch in my head. Um, or during that pregnancy, um, as to refocus and find myself again, rather than keeping worrying about you know other people and what they're doing and they're winning, I started focusing on me again, and I started thinking like you know what I know I can break thirty minutes, and if I'm going to be in against you know someone that's taking drugs or whatever, then they're going to have to run twenty nine thirty then to beat me, because that's just oh. the that attitude that I took. That's a, that's a nice way of uh, of thinking uh, that I'm going to run 30 minutes, and if they have they are cheating, they have to run you know, at a faster time than what you're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so so 1992 from 1992 actually you took uh, you know you told me that uh, you know you always knew that you're going to run a uh, run marathons, yeah. uh, but after 1992 you actually ran the marathon and you also were the uh, had the fastest time as a as a debutant, uh, you know. Um, uh, how was that uh, change from your training in the training schedule? Because you're training for 10,000 meters, uh, yeah. but then you started running the half marathons and marathons. Were yeah. there any major changes you had to do? Yeah, the 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 New York Marathon, which was my first marathon, which was like um, some like November after I won in uh, my world champion. So I'd just become world champion, and um, it was just by sheer. Um, it wasn't planned my first marathon what happened was <clears throat> Fred Lebeau who is the New York who was New York marathon organizer he called me up um just after I think it was about a week and a half after I'd won my world title and he said Liz you know this is Fred from New York marathon he says we just had a press conference and Lisa Andoniki and Rosa Mota who were the two top marathon girls in the field for New York that year at the press conference, they were asked, oh, a young Scottish girl who's just won the 10,000 metres, do you ever think she'll be a good marathon runner? And they both turned around and said no. They said that I'm a track runner and I waste too much energy and I wouldn't run fast on the roads. So Fred said to me, do you want to come and prove them wrong? And I just said, yeah, OK. <laughs> <That's how laughs> so I, I only had, like, literally seven weeks training. 
But um, and and all I did was I did a couple of long. I did a two eighteen mile runs. Kept my like normally I would do um, six by a mile. I did one session of ten by a mile and went and ran it. But oh, bear in mind, as a ten k runner, I was I was I was running one hundred and ten. 115 miles a week as a 10k runner so it's not like you know I, I don't do distance I just don't do 20 odd mile runs and things like that which you know I, I didn't need to do okay I mean, uh, they should have uh, known better than challenging you actually so uh, <laughs> to want, uh, and uh, telling that you could not so uh, so it's amazing that you know you took a liking towards it uh, but over a period of time when you started running you know the New York Marathon then you actually won the London Marathon and the Tokyo yeah. um, well, because were there I, any were, were there any changes in the in the training schedule? Yeah, because I I did so well in New York, uh, it, it's actually sort of like um, it was the beginning of the end, really, because I didn't want to move up to the marathon until a lot later. But then, because I got like an instant success in New York, um, I then got offered a, a a contract for London Marathon, and it was a too good a contract to turn down, and so it then kind of put me into a marathon career that was a lot earlier than I anticipated um, and to be honest the change in my training um, I've never been a person that's run lots of over miles so like I used to run like um, sort of 19 miles but run it quick as a long run pardon me and then um, it was just basic things like so as a track runner you know I, I do you know as I said sort of six by a mile so for the marathon I would do 10 by a mile but the thing was I do those 10 by a mile, probably about just maybe five seconds of a differential of what I used to do as a track runner. So I still okay. kept a lot of good quality, but I just lengthened it out. And so, um, and I did lot of, lots of like, um, I was a big believer in like um, half mile hill reps, which was one of my toughest sessions. Um, so I used to do like 10 by um, 800 meters up a hill which was quite a steep hill and you get that tiredness in the legs that you get when you're running a marathon um and then you, you know a lot of tempo running I, I started introducing an awful lot of tempo running um like sort of over 10 12 miles and things like that which um you know sort of like five ten mile pace with a heart rate of like 164 so i was very very economical so i i, I went more for the economical side rather than the high 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 intensity that i used to do on the track but at the same time because i came from that track background my speed was still pretty good even for doing 10 and 12 mile sessions. Okay. So uh, we have heard a lot about uh, Liz as an athlete. Uh, uh, how is Liz as a coach? Um, totally different. Um, I, if I tried to coach the way I coach myself, I'd have no athletes. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, I, I've learned through myself, through trial and error. Um, but I'm a big believer that when you coach, um, you cannot coach every athlete the same. So um, I, when I coach my athletes, I get to know the athlete and then I tweak what I need to tweak for that program to fit theirs. But I have a certain ethos that I believe in for 10K running to marathon running. Um, you know, I have a sort of template that I believe that this is the way you should train towards it, but it's different from individual to individual. Okay. Um, so you already you are, you have an organization you're heading an organization in Doha uh, wherein you are providing coaching uh, not only for schools but also for adults. So yeah. uh, and uh, the hobby runners who are coming up now uh, you know who love to first buy their shoes and then start running. Uh, so uh, what are the things uh, you have come across in your uh, you know from your trainees? Uh, what do they want? Especially the hobby runners who are in their mid forties and above. What we find, what we find is with the older sort of hobby runners, as you call them, is a lot of bad habits, um, you know. And um, I think that what what we tend to do in Doha is try to strip it back to basics of athletics. So we try to get them to use the feet properly, um, to actually get breathing technique properly, um, and even simple things of correcting that makes a massive difference in how they run. Um, but you know, we we. we we try to encourage, again, it's very individual because, you know, even hobby runners have different goal sets and, you know, um, they come in all different shapes and sizes as well. And so you've got to take that into account. But what we tend to do is try to have a basics of trying to strengthen the structure before you run. And once you strengthen the structure, then you can build and then you can run. And that's kind of what we do here in Doha. We, we have school programs, we do ABC, we do agility and ability. 
um, teaching very, very early years on how to use feet, how to place bodies, so that they know how to use the body before they even go into sport, which is a really good thing. And it could be swimming or football or whatever, but every sport has athleticism in it. And we teach how to prepare at a very, very early age, how to prepare for to go into sport. And then, um, and again, we've got like um, a, a little club here that we have um, that kids. They're not they're not going to all be elite, but they they love to run, and we like to encourage lifestyles of any kid to be active. So this is what we do in Doha. That's nice. So, um, have you got uh, any uh, hobby runners who says you know within first few weeks of training that they want to run really fast, a uh, really fast marathon? We all, we always we always have people. And then they'll say, oh, I'm doing my first marathon and I want to do it in this time. And my advice to them is take the time out of it. You know, a mar marathon running is amazing. For it is tough. It's a lot of time on your feet. So why restrict yourself to a number? You know, your first marathon should be an experience that they enjoy. And when you finish it, you're ready to do another one. You know, you don't want you don't want to overly push it and everything on your first one. And you want it to go to plan so that you actually do execute the best race that you possibly can do on that day. And sometimes I think we can just bag ourselves down too much by this. I want to run sub three hours or I want to run sub four hours. And I want to, you know, just embrace it. You know, embrace being a marathon runner. Just get out there and do it and, and just leave the sort of, uh, there's an old saying, leave the monkey at the door, like, you know, uh, it's like, you know, don't, don't just, um, don't just limit yourself from what you think, you know, a, a decent time is because at the end of the day, whether you run it in three hours, two hours, five hours, you're a marathoner at the end of the day. Okay. Well, that, that's a nice thing to say, actually, because a lot of, uh, uh, especially when they are reaching above 40 and 45 and they are mm -hmm. looking to run a marathon, they always want to run faster times and they end up getting injured. So, but I like the way you said it, that don't restrict uh, yourself to, uh, to a number, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's an experience by itself. Yes. Yeah. So, exactly. um, you all, you're also into nutrition, uh, which is one, one more aspect of your company. I mean, uh, what are the changes in nutrition? Uh, what changes have happened during maybe from where, when you were actually training as an athlete and currently? Uh, what are any major changes which has happened? Uh, changes in my lifestyle? No, uh, in a sports nutrition. Oh, sports nutrition. No, it's massive. I mean, there's so much. There's maybe too much information out there now um, on the internet. You know, uh, all information is, to avail is available to all, whether they are experienced people that are giving you those information or non-experienced, probably more non-experienced people giving information now on the internet than really should be allowed. Um, you know, sometimes I see some really bad advice from people that aren't coaches, they're not qualified in anything they do, and they're trying to tell someone, because they ran a marathon or ran 10K, they now think that they can then tell other people how they did it. And, you know, and it's not really right. So, you know, I don't think that you should listen to everything that's out there, but there is a lot of advice on nutrition. Um, and nutrition to me is eating a, a, a good diet. You know, I, I don't think it's a great idea to diet, to do sport because you know your energy levels need to be good for to perform with at all levels doesn't matter what level that is um if you're a, a fun runner or an elite athlete you know if you haven't got a good nutrition then you're not going to get a good performance at the end of the day so you know nutrition is really really important but the most important thing is recovery and nutrition for recovery you know a lot of people tend to think oh well you know i'm going to go for a 20 mile run so i'll eat my past and whatever and then they forget about the recovery phase which is after the run which is the most important so that you don't get up and you're stiff the next morning so you know it, it's 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 really important that you check out your your balanced diet and that you've got your recovery plan in place so that you've got good protein um, after you exercise so that your muscles are building and repairing as you're sleeping at night. Wonderful. So uh, you, you talked about uh, somebody who has just run one 10K or a, or a marathon and they start giving advice. Uh, you know, and they even write a book, uh, you know, so <laughs> about their experience. Uh, but I uh, just wanted to ask you, I mean, uh, you you had a wonderful life as an athlete and also coaching your daughter. Uh, any any book uh, coming on uh, on on your uh, achievements? No, no, not at all. Um, I I was like, before I retired, um, we had signed a deal to actually 
do a, not a bi- to do a biography on me uh, about my life and whatever. And then um, some lady called Adrian Blue went and did an autobiography without my permission. And okay. uh, so there was a book written, but it was without my permission. And that stopped the real book getting done. So right. no, no, there's so, no pipe. There's, there's nothing in the pipe. You, you should have one now. Maybe that would have been a couple of a few years back. So, you know, now, now you, I mean, it might be a better way of, of you know, you should actually relook at it. And I'm sure... <laughs> You know, uh, we would love to, you know, to read what uh, when I bought about you. So I think you should. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have just uh, come to the end of the interview. So I just wanted to, before you sign off, uh, any final advice uh, uh, to uh, to athletes on achieving their goals. My 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 final advice would be to believe in yourself and never be afraid to dream big okay uh thank you very much liz uh, i think it's been a pleasure uh, talking to you can you just be in the studio for a few uh few minutes uh, while i just thank my audience uh, okay. and uh, but it's been a pleasure and it's so nice to hear your story uh, okay. very inspirational and motivating for all and i'm sure uh, you know, when they uh, look back at this interview, they would enjoy the moments. Uh, you know, all the things what you have said is of real importance, and I hope Thanks. that you know it'll inspire others in my country to to win a medal. <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you just be in the studio just a minute? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so thank you very much for tuning in. It's been a wonderful experience uh, talking to uh, Liz McCorgan. And her story is inspirational, and I hope that uh, you'll be tuning in for further interviews. Uh, yes, the next interview is on 22nd, and uh, we got uh, Mr. Douglas Wakihuri from Kenya, uh, who's a silver medalist in uh, Olympics for marathon, who will be coming in and talking to us. Uh, so till then, uh, um, it's uh, good night uh, to to all of you in uh, uh, tuning in, and uh, see you sometime later. Thank you so much.